Uh, Rick, Rick, I was hoping, hoping we could talk a little bit about you before we talk about the movie, because you have a very uh, unique background and perspective that you bring to this film. Uh, namely that you're not from the film industry, but you're actually a writer, an author, as I understand it. You've written a number of books about NASA and the space program. So my first question for you is, could you tell me and the audience a little bit about your background as a writer and what drew you to having a body of work that focuses specifically on the subject? Well, I've been a writer for 25 years, and uh, quite a bit of that time has been spent in the world of NASCAR. I covered uh, that sport full time for about 25 years, uh, and I guess I just have a passion for things that go really fast. So uh, I have always uh, been intrigued by ordinary people who can do extraordinary things. Uh, you, you, you see a race car at Talladega going 200 miles an hour and, and you're fascinated by uh, how somebody is able to control that. Uh, I'm also fascinated by people who are willing to climb to the top of a pointy rocket, strap in, let somebody black the fuse. How, how, why would somebody be willing to do that? Uh, so, so that has always, always been a fascination of mine. Uh, as, far as, as, as far as the space program goes, uh, I can remember very vividly being a kid, being, being probably four years old. My dad was in Vietnam, and my mom and I were watching TV, and we were watching one of the late moon landings. And um, it, every other word that the astronauts said seemed to be Houston. And, and so, so when my four-year-old line, they were talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that, that, I, I think that, that I really think that that was my introduction in, in, into the space business. Right. So um, I've always enjoyed writing. Uh, I, did I did not major in journalism in college. I should have. Uh, but I've always been able to write. And so uh, I, I got an award uh, with NASCAR. And covered that sport full time, uh, wrote some books, and uh, my career in space journalism uh, began when uh, Tom Burns, uh, who is one of the biggest space editors, space book editors, uh, posted on one of the space forums. And uh, one of his authors had backed out, and he needed an author. Uh, he needed a series, and he needed several authors to collaborate on a book about the moon landings. And I was one of the few people who uh, responded that he was actually a professional writer. And uh, I was able to do the lead chapter uh, for that book on the flight of Apollo 11. And once I did, got my foot in the door, uh, I kicked it in. Uh, that led to a book on the space shuttle program, uh, which led to a book on astronaut David Elmer's which led to a book on mission control and and, and a film. Yes. yes. So, so getting, getting to the book about mission control on which this film is ultimately based, there, there are so, so many different aspects of the space program. How did you arrive at, you know, was there, was there like a moment where a light bulb went off and said, I, I'm going to do something about mission control specifically? How did you arrive at that moment where you decided this was, this this was, was what your next chapter, in yes. essence, would be in a series of books about the space program? Well, it's funny you should mention that. Um, when I was in Houston, Texas, for uh, the research and interviews on the David Helmer's book, uh, Milton Heflin, who was the uh, co-author, who would eventually become the co-author on uh, the Go Flight book uh, on mission control. The name of my book on mission control, by the way, is Go Flight, The Unsung Heroes of Mission Control. It's available on Amazon. It's available at Barnes & Noble. I just want to get that plug in. <laughs> uh, I ordered some books to be here, but they didn't make it to the hotel in time. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, Milt uh, took me on a tour while I was in Houston. Uh, of Johnson Space Center. 
He took, he took me, me to the robotics laboratory, uh, and I shook hands with the robot, and that was pretty cool. Uh, he took me on the tour. He took me on, on the tour of the Nuclear Boys Laboratory, where they do the, the training uh, for the space walks and the big pool, uh, and that was pretty awesome. Uh, but but then, then he took me into the, uh, the historic Apollo era uh, mission control room on, on the third, third floor of the, the MCC there, the Mission Control Center. And when I stepped foot in that room, I was hammered by a sense of history. I literally stopped walking. And I, I, I literally had tears in my eyes because you think about it, and when Neil Armstrong said Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed, he was talking about that room. When he later said that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he was talking to the entire world through that room. When the crew of Apollo 13 reported Houston would have a problem, they were talking to that room. The last words that the crew challenger ever spoke were to that room. And I was, I, right now, even talking about that, I got these chills. And I just have a huge respect for what went on in that room. And in that moment, I knew that I wanted to do something to honor the people who work there, but I, if I had written a book for every book idea that I've ever had, it would fill this room in 24. Uh, but probably six months later, uh, I got an email from Colin, uh, my, my editor, uh, on the, the Space Shuttle book and the, the Moon Landing book. And he said that the series had been expanded, and he asked me if I had any other book ideas. And I said, Colin, it's funny you should mention that. And I told him about the idea on mission control. And that, Adam, that was, <laughs> that was the easiest book pitch I've ever had because it was such a no brainer. Gene Francis had written a book, Chris Pratt had written a book, um, and there had been uh, one previous book uh, in the past that they kind of dealt with mission control, but it just forged your purpose was about the Apollo program as a whole. And it, it was it was the easiest pitch I've ever had. And the participation in this project has just was was just incredible. Just one one interview led to another to another to another. And I, I literally interviewed basically every single person that I wanted to. And once you completed the book, two-part question, did you ever imagine that it would come to fruition that one day you would see a documentary film based on your book? Because it's the first part of my question. And the second is, can you sort of shepherd the audience through a little bit of that process? We're so accustomed to having actors and directors here, but you're an author and your work has been purposed into uh, a very interesting documentary film. So take us through a little bit of that. I, I can assure you that I never thought that I would ever be sitting here before we were like this, uh, talking about a project, a film project that I, that I was associated with, uh, based on something that I, that I worked on. Uh, the, the way that it all came about, uh, I, I, knew that this, I knew that the book and the material was strong enough to support something like this. Uh, but finding somebody willing to back it, to support it uh, financially, uh, that, that's the trick. And I spent uh, probably, I couldn't even tell you at the time frame. Uh, because I, I, even before I finished writing the book, I was, I was already pitching agents to, 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 the pro, to the pitch it. Uh, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how many 
proposals to the Senate and they approached each other. They, uh, some, some didn't even answer. Some <coughs> rejected it out of hand. Some weren't honest about it. Uh, and eventually, uh, I met Pete Haviland, and who was the who was the, the producer uh, who really got it all jump started. And one thing led to another, and here we are. Let me take it out to the audience now for some questions. Do <coughs> you yeah, have a question, as we mentioned? Please raise your hand. And we're going to start with this individual right over here. How disappointed were the mission control guys that we have not left a low uh, space orbit since Apollo 17? Would you, Would you like the real answer or the politically correct answer? The real answer would be that when Apollo 17 uh, left lunar orbit, uh, left the lunar surface, there, there, were, there were none of those flight con controllers who ever thought that it would be this long. Uh, I think the entire space industry, not, not just the controllers, but the astronauts, the controllers, the, uh, the, the contractors, uh, I, I think everybody uh, expected at some point to jump start out of Earth orbit. I fully blame the Nixon administration. If, 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 if Nixon had not canceled the Apollo program, we would be on Mars now, if not further. Uh, because when Kennedy stood before Congress and said, we're going to go to the moon before the end of the decade, the technology to do so did not exist. The procedures did not exist. The equipment did not exist. America's sum total of human space flight was less than 15 minutes in suborbit. We had not been around the Earth yet. And in Eight years, we were standing on the surface of the moon. And you project that eight more years, where would we be? We, the cell phone that's in my pocket, smartphone that's in my pocket, our, our technology has gone from Kennedy's pronouncement in Congress to the surface of the moon to our pockets. If we had, if we had taken that same projection outward, there's no telling where we would be. No telling. <coughs> you, uh, I guess we're going to go over to this side now. I, I don't answer. I don't, I don't answer, answer questions from Yankees. Long conversation about that part of this. I just say this right, right here. Right here right 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 I'm a brave man. You're on the fringe. Proclamation aside, I will still ask you. This was fantastic, but I'll enjoy it very much. It it seems to me that. In watching this, that as much as the landing on the moon was an incredible accomplishment, that these men almost got a greater sense of accomplishment from Apollo 13, from what they did. But when they went to the moon, that was planned. What they did for Apollo 13 was not planned. Do you get that sense in, in talking to them that they got as much of that more satisfaction out of that? Actually, of, 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 all, of, the, of all the Apollo missions, to a person, the people that I interviewed said that Apollo 8 was their grand achievement because it was such a leap. It was such a 
they would, would, ne they they would never use the term gamble because, because you just, just don't say that in NASA. NASA. You don't, don't use the term gamble. But, but it, it was, was such a leap of faith. <laughs> The last, the last time that the Saturn V vehicle had launched was on Apollo 6. And it had gone all kinds of haywire. They had had all kinds of problems with it. It had flown too low, it had flown sideways, it had flown, it had all, all kinds of what they call logo, uh, which is a really bad vibration, uh, oscillation. Um, they worked those out, and the next time that the Saturn V flew, they had humans on top of it for, Saturn, for Apollo 8. And they sent them to the moon. That's the point. They did not have a backup plan. They didn't have a lunar module. So if an Apollo 13 type issue that happened, they were toast. Um, and they basically made the decision in August, and they flew in December. And that took guts, if not another part of the <laughs> and that that was probably that the people that I talked to that was their highest achievement because it was such a gutsy call. Apollo eleven landed, but they they had done the testing. They had landed on the moon a million times during testing. Actually. When they actually landed on the moon for real on July 20, 1969, several said eh, it, was, it was just like any other simulation. But Apollo 8, that was, that, that was the big test. That was the big lead. All right, next question. I'm going to go over here with Mike. I was wondering if the effort isn't to go uh, back to the moon and beyond. I haven't heard anything about, and there used to be a lot of talk on a periodic basis about the International Space Station. Is that where the efforts of NASA is? Is in cooperation with other countries on the space station at this point, and not further space travel? I think that, I think, I think NASA's, NASA's firm plan right now is the International Space Station. And there has always been talk, we're going to go to the moon at some point. We're going to go to the moon by 2030. We're going to go to the moon by 2035. We're going to go to Mars by some point after that. What made Kennedy's mandate special was, guys, if we're going to the moon by the end of this decade, you're on the clock. Do it. What also made that mandate special was Congress gave them the money. And America's, American, the, the American public gave them the will to do it. The will of the American people gave them the the the, the impetus to do it. So I, I think NASA's I think NASA's program I, I think NASA's firm efforts are behind the the International Space Station. <coughs> There's the the Space Launch System, which is this great big rocket. That's even bigger, bigger than the, the, the Saturn V. I don't, I don't necessarily, necessarily know what they're going to do with it, or when they're going to do it. So, so, so that's, that's kind of the issue that I see with it. It's all going to go back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you kind of um, answered some of this, but in your opinion, uh, I remember growing up and seeing all of those models, and they were like magic. I mean, you know, as you said, as the film showed and we all knew, it was like you flew glued to the TV. It was a magical event. What gets some of the, uh, you know, I know that we are, we've got unmanned uh, uh, spaceships looking at things and stuff like that. We've got the Internet space, uh, Station, but what brings some of that excitement back to to the space program? So it's not just a little blip in the news that we're looking at Mars or something like that. How do we get some of that energy back into it so that you know it's it's a, it's a, it's a media event to get it? Well, first of all, I believe that this nation has to have the capability to launch humans back into space. Right now, we have to pay the Russians. I don't even know what the price tag is now. It's 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. It is quite a bit of money. Uh, we, the American, we as a nation, have to be able to launch human beings in space ourselves, and, and we have to do it. Pretty quickly, as, as, as soon as we safely can. Now, there's there's efforts by private companies to do that, uh, like SpaceX, and I think that that would be a great thing. Uh, and when that happens, uh, there's talk about it happening. I think 2018 or so, uh, 2019 or so. Uh, but, but we have to have the capability as a nation to do it. <coughs> take this gentleman in the center over here. <coughs> Along the same lines of sparking interest into the future for the space program, do you think the Chinese effort to land on the moon, which they're playing, they have a very organized program, one that happens that'll jumpstart us into feeling that we're really behind? <coughs> I don't think most Americans realize we can't even put an astronaut into orbit anymore. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't, don't know, know that we, we consider the Chinese enough, enough of an enemy. enemy. Um, um, if, if we, we had not been terrified of the Soviet, Soviet Union uh, as, as a nation, we would have never walked on the moon. If, if we had not been trying, trying to defeat their system of government, uh, their ideology, uh, we would never have walked on the moon. We, we basically would not have had a space program. Uh, that was basically the impetus for the whole thing. Uh, when Sputnik uh, flew, when the Russian satellite Sputnik flew in October of 1957, that started the whole thing. And uh, if, if, if and when uh, China ever seriously gets that program going towards the moon, uh, I, I don't know. I would hope so. Because I'm a fan of the space program. I, I'm an American. I hope my nation can go back to the moon at some point. Uh, I, I'm a competitive person. I hope my nation can go. And I hope that we can go before the, the Chinese do, or the Russians do, or whoever else. Uh, so I, I don't know that there is enough of a sense of competition there. We're going to take a few more questions on the case sort of to my left. And then we can talk about that. We'll talk about this all night. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yes. Do you know, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you know how involved NASA is with, say, SpaceX and these other private programs? And what's the input of NASA or the, or the, you know, the conversation back and forth between NASA and these private endeavors? I, I really don't. Uh, I'm more of a, I'm more of a histor uh, space historian than I am uh, than I keep up with the current events. I know that there's some, I know that there's a lot of back and forth because uh, SpaceX is using uh, the facilities at Kennedy Space Center. 
uh, the actual Saturn V launch pad, former Saturn V launch pads, are now being used uh, by SpaceX. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, so yeah, there's some cooperation there, uh, but I really, I really kind of think that NASA is kind of taking a wait and see approach to see how that goes. The center toward the back, yes. Uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, for being here, for screening this. It's an incredible film. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've been a, long, a lifelong space enthusiast. I uh, got it from my dad. Um, my question is, uh, you know, everyone obviously in mission control during these missions was so professional, you know, military-like uh, discipline. And when they're on screen here, they have that same professionalism. Some of them get uh, a little more personal. Uh, what were they like off screen when the camera wasn't rolling? Uh, were they the same, uh, that same presentation, or do you get anything more personal or um, anything noteworthy? <laughs> it the nail. Wow. Uh, I, could I, I, I could write about four books on it the nail. They would have to come and write brown paper wrappers <laughs> with triple X's on the covers. Maybe half of the stories would be true. All would be embellished to some extent or another. Um, Infidel is, is probably, um, it was probably my favorite character. In, in the story. Uh, Infidel, he has a two-year associate's degree in merchandising. In merchandising. <laughs> and he chased girls and drank whiskey and smoked cigars while he was getting that degree. And he became in charge of all things of public communication. <laughs> that is an extraordinary story. Now, I say that in a silly manner. When Ed Fendel stepped into that control center, he was extraordinarily serious. Bob Carlton, um, the gentleman with the Cute curly hair, snow white hair, as my wife, my wife calls it. Uh, he dropped out of school in the ninth grade. In the ninth grade. And drove a logging truck. And joined the Air Force and found out that he was smart. And landed somebody on the surface of the moon. Jerry Bostic, who is probably one of my favorite, not probably, he is one of my favorite people in the world, introduced me to the film crew as his adopted son. You know, there's, these guys aren't superheroes. They're just ordinary people from, every, from every day of walks of life, who did this incredible thing once upon a time. And that's what made me so passionate about sharing their stories. Because they deserve the recognition. Uh, and the cool thing that I've seen has been how much fun they've been having since the book has come out and since this film has come out. Before we conclude tonight, Rick, I want to go back to one of the questions you were asked and a couple of things that you eliminated in your answer. Uh, the, the framework, I suppose you could say, or the foundation, if you will, that had put into place the possibilities that had happened in the 1960s. Uh, one, this notion of 
the need for the United States to perhaps, in the context of putting somebody on the moon, have some country against which they felt an emergency to compete, and that that variable at present arguably does not exist, and that those nations against which the United States is presently engaged in you know, ongoing warfare uh, don't pose uh, a strength, if you will, to you know, leverage themselves in a way that the Soviet Union was perceived at the time in the 60s, and part and parcel of that, the will of the people, and that we are presently, at least in this country, you know, yeah, undergoing a tumultuous time in which there is no singular will of the people, and we are in a very fractured place, if you will, domestically. So with these two variables being seemingly not only non-existent, but perhaps not necessarily on the horizon, where do you see the space program in the foreseeable future going? I really think that SpaceX is on the right track. Because I really think that Elon Musk has a clear vision and a clear goal. And he has some pocket change to do it with. Um, and if and when we get beyond Earth orbit, I believe that he he is going to be part of it in, in some way, shape, form, fashion. I, I think he's going to be part so of the, it. So the, the, the privatized approach will probably perhaps be at the forefront rather than wrong. Okay. But because I, I, I think as far as the government side of it goes, I, I just think that the American people, uh, right now, I just think we can't get out of our own way. Um, with, with Twitter and Facebook and 24-hour news cycle and, and people talking on news shows and people yelling at each other and I, I, I can't say it, there's too much noise. Shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. And I don't care if you're liberal or conservative. I don't care if you're gay or straight. Shut up. Just shut up. Yay! I'm not running for office, by the way. <laughs> well, Rick, I want to thank you so much. Um, this has been a very enlightening Q&A. Uh, I know I certainly have learned quite a few things that I knew nothing about. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, as well, for bringing some great questions to the table. So, folks, let's give Rick a really good round. Thank you so much.